Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Glenn Stevens, and he's going to take away the uh, the second slot tonight, talking about the hidden dangers of design sprints. Welcome to the stage, Glenn. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm going to let you take it away, and uh, I will come back uh, at the end to do the Q&A and, um, and sign off. So uh, take it away. Yes, thank you, Annie. Um, my talk is going to be about the hidden dangers of design sprints. Um, by the way, I've noticed that my camera is a bit jumpy. I, I couldn't fix it, so I am sorry. Um, I do know that audio is good, so that's the most important. A uh, quick word about me. Uh, in the past, I've worked as a service designer, a UX lead and UX strategist, and I've done UX research, uh, mostly qualitative, but some quantitative. This last year, uh, now I'm doing UX research, um, focusing more and more on that, and I'm mixing methods. Um, that means using both qualitative and quantitative to focus in on an issue, to gather both deep insights and the scale of things, combining multiple sources to increase the robustness of our data. I'm also involved in research operations, um, both internal on team level and for international alignment across countries. And finally, one of my main subjects is UX metrics, how to persuasively demonstrate the results and the impact of our work in terms of how we're helping the user, but also helping the business move forward. Now, last time I spoke here was in 2019, and it was about using service design to define backend capabilities. And I still believe that to be a solid approach. However, not all of my views remain the same. I'm here today to talk to you about design sprints, why I have stopped using them, and in general, why I'm convinced that UX people should stop using them too, at least in their regular form. We will zoom in together on what's wrong with them, why, and how to fix that. Now, I stopped using design sprints a long time ago, mainly because I started to learn more and more about research, and it simply did not match with what design sprints were claiming. But what set me on the way to give this talk is more recent, and it's a very important article published in Fast Company earlier this year. It's an article by Jesse James Garrett. He is quite known in, in the UX field. He wrote a very famous book, a, a small book, Elements of User Experience, quite famous for the five planes of user experience. And he is not happy. <laughs> he is not amused by the current state of UX. And one of the things he mentions is UX has evolved or not evolved, devolved towards something more superficial, less based on actual insights, even becoming UX theater, where form becomes more important than function. And this is something we will discuss in this talk. Secondly, he also spoke about how UX terminology is misused by people who do not understand the underlying principles, by companies, consultancies, and agencies cherry picking the easy bits of UX, the visual bits that are an easy match with their existing way of working without bothering about deeper work. And these two are themes we will explore today and see how they apply to design sprints. Luckily, he also ends on a positive note. His conclusion was that it is in fact a sign of our health that there are people from the inside being able to critique these things. And I believe that to be true. It uh, echoes for me one of my favorite quotes from a very good Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, um, from a guy called, called Jason uh, Jaren Lanier. And he said, it's the critics who are the true optimists. They are the ones who drive improvement. And I absolutely believe that constructive criticism is the way forward. So that is what I will attempt to do with this talk. Now, before we dive in, a quick word about what is a design sprint. So a design sprint is a five day or four or three, apparently uh, process first used at Google Ventures for use with startups, uh, where a small team clears their schedule for a week and dedicates themselves to follow a precisely prescribed process, which ends in a prototype that's been seen by five people, uh, five potential users. The, the book on the left was actually first, the black book. No one has read it. The book on the right has become ultra popular. And the, the small team that they discuss, it consists, according to the book, um, of a decider, which is either a product manager, if it's a bigger company, or a CEO, if it's a startup, someone from finance, marketing, customer, expert. 
uh, technology, and finally, design. But the book points out that if you don't have a designer, just take a product manager. Um, yeah, which I guess makes sense because there indeed are many startups without uh, UX people. Now, it has been growing in popularity towards an immense scale. And whenever I see people jump on the bandwagon, I think it necess necessitates us to become skeptical. And yeah, I will take this time to point out many weaknesses I perceive in design sprints because I'm convinced that it's needed because so much of what is shared online today about design sprints is just the good news. There is so much hype around it and it requires to be compensated with a reality check. So my goal is to move from this image where I see a lot of people, UX people I, I deeply respect looking at design sprints as the next big thing and convince them that it's been snake oil all along. And it's this for two reasons, two big reasons. One, extremely sketchy, invalid research practices. And two, this one size fits all UX by templates that is devaluing real UX. Now, let's start with the research. So there are two big moments in the design sprint where it talks about research. One is on day one and one is on day five. And these two days correspond with two big problems about research that they have. Let's start with day one. It's easy. There is no research. There is only internal interviews with internal subject matters. There is no research into the user's problem space. And, and this is important because, as Dennis pointed out as well, for new product ideas to which the design sprint is a self-declared perfect match, this is an unnecessarily risky, wasteful, and anti-user-centered way of working. You need the research into the problem to understand where are the unmet needs, where are those latent needs. The only interviews done are with internal experts, not with users, which completely stands in opposition to the you are not the user uh, dogma used by everyone, um, especially by people who don't understand what it actually means. Journey mapping is done live in a workshop as a group guessing adventure instead of prepared by actual researchers and based on actual evidence. And it, begs, it raises the question, how do we know something is a real problem for someone? How do we even know something is a good idea? And the idea is the, is the topic that the entire design sprint will organize around. If you don't know our users needs to judge those ideas against. Until the very last day, Everything in the design sprint is seen only through the lens of the internal stakeholders. And this is not how it works. You cannot simply ask a bunch of internal people some questions in one day that can end up determining the fate of a big project that might affect thousands, if not millions of people. It's those early decisions that matter the most because it is those decisions that lay the groundwork for the things to come. And in fact, design sprints take pride in skipping the research phase. Phase. The book briefly talks about a research sprint, some optional thing you could consider doing when you don't really know a lot about what you're doing. However, the people marketing the design sprint make it really clear it does not happen. This is a quote from one of the most famous design sprint agencies. Basically, they just dive in the, the mock-up phase, uh, which, and I agree with Dennis, is not the way forward. Now, <clears throat> the problem is that when you spend more time doing these assumptive workshops with people from marketing than you do getting to know your users, it becomes quite difficult to defend your own process as something that's user-centered, because it's not. If you only ask internal expert things, you go against you are not a user, as I mentioned. Design Sprint seems to teach us that research is optional. And as a consequence, teams start building heavily on assumptions, which by definition is not user-centered and it's not UX, and you don't have to take my word for it, the ISO norms of UX literally say it needs to start based on an explicit understanding of the user, their goals, their context, and their needs. And the, the question becomes that if those design sprints are not rooted in those true unmet user needs, to what are they leading? The arts and crafts project might be fun, but it could be that it leads to nowhere. And Nate Bolt, the founder of the research firm Ethnio, expressed this quite well. Like, if you do not know the direction you're headed in, if you are not guided by user needs, you are not doing UX. Um, and well, 
maybe, let's hope so, I, I've said that in the fifth day, um, the design sprint actually foresees research with actual users. So maybe all of this is improved on the fifth day. Now, unfortunately, the situation is actually worse because instead of ignorance, it's straight up front lies. And you can see the lies here. So both the book and, and all of the, the websites and everyone promoting the design sprint, they talk about on the final day, we will test to see is your value proposition valid. Um, we will validate your business model. We will see if people want your product, will use it. We will try to predict product market fit. This is plain wrong. Now to understand why, I will introduce you to some useful vocabulary. A vocabulary that comes from something called the user experience honeycomb invented by Peter Morville in 2004. He's one of the co-authors of the famous information architecture book, the one with the polar bear. And so basically what design sprints do, they claim that they measure utility and desirability. However, they apply, as we will see in detail, they apply usability testing. So this is a mismatch. And this mismatch is a serious offense. And here's why. It creates invalid research. And in research, validity is an important concept. And it can mean it has many forms, uh, many different types of definitions and many subdivisions, but in its most pure form, it is this. Are you measuring what you intend to measure? Does your method match your research needs? So let's look at design sprints. The intent is product ID validation, product market fit. The method is usability testing with a little bit of customer interviewing. And the results in the best case, it's a list of uncovered usability problems, combined mostly with some self-reported first impressions and speculative answers to would you questions, which is then completely falsely seen by design sprinters to validate the potential success of the innovation idea. And to make that mistake even worse, the book itself and all of its practitioners reference this graph to then argue, well, five users is enough for validation. Look, usability tests are not meant for ID validation. Saying that five users are enough for product validation is a complete misinterpretation. And Jacob is watching and he's judging. And what he's telling you is just look at the name on the I axis. It says usability problems. The only time you can refer to the five user argument is when you're talking about usability problems, nothing else. Usability testing tells you one thing, what are the usability problems? The goal is to discover problem. It does not validate your product idea. And then I hear some of you thinking, and, and I get this a lot when I explain this to people like, yeah, but actually our usability testing, it's more like concept testing. No, look, either you apply usability testing and you can use the five users argument or you do something else and then you cannot. You can't have it both ways. By the way, concept testing, not a research method. It has no, defined, agreed upon meaning. Uh, if you ask 10 people what it is, you get 10 different answers. So in short, the five users argument, which by the way, comes from a 1993 paper, does not apply to the design sprint. So, okay, if usability testing doesn't tell us if people would use it, if it doesn't validate product market fit, what does? Well, let's go back to the honeycomb. So usefulness, that's where it starts. It's all about understanding the problem, getting to the unmet needs, getting to, like Danny said, the latent needs your users might have. You use observations, contextual inquiries, sometimes used in a fancy word called ethnography, or you use good quality, non-speculative interviews, asking about recent examples, getting real stories, avoiding speculation and rationalization. And then if you're after desirableness, like to really validate your product, do people want it? Release it. <laughs> and if the release is too risky, de-risk the release by doing live experiments first. Um, th th there's been a very popular book come out uh, recently. I hate it, it it's unreadable. There's a much shorter 
much more pleasant book that came out in 2018 that I recommend to anyone. But I'm talking about things like landing page testing, fake door, Wizard of Oz MVP, button to nowhere, that kind of stuff. So this is at a glance looking at research through a UX lens. But you do not have to take my word for it or the word of Don Norman or Jacob Nielsen. You can take advice from these guys. And what they say is, you just give people a solution that has been created purely on internal assumptions. It's literally what's said there. Now, by doing so, you create a precedent. Your solution idea becomes a point of reference that constrains all the further discussions with your team and with your test participants. Confirmation bias, some cost fallacy all kick in. Then it's referred to it as killing your darlings and how difficult it is. It's true. You're in the funnel. You're in the you're captured in the local maximum of your first solution. This is bad. It puts your solution and your decision making at considerable risk. It hides flaws in your assumptions. It blinds you from bigger unmet needs. And that's exactly why upfront research is so important. You start from observable facts. You gather real insights from your user's real context. You see where are the needs unmet. What is a good thing to help them solve their situation? That's how you know ideas can be good. That's how real innovation works. That's how UX works. Now, up until now, we've discussed the, that the main goal of research is to get insights to lower risk. Um, and in Design Sprint's case, the most important phase of research is skipped, and the only remaining research is misapplied and misinterpreted. But everything we've discussed so far is about risk towards the product you are facing. It's important, but it's small. Next, I'll show you how the Design Sprint hype carries dangers to not just the product at hand, but our UX field at large. And it's a problem that I've split into three elements. On the one hand, you have the, the concept of templatization. Everything becomes a template. It leads to UX theater. Next, you have this idea of everyone can design, which leads to design by committee. And, next, and, and finally, the emphasis put by design sprinters on speed, speed above quality, speed above results. Now, templatization. So a little story. Um, in the South Pacific Ocean, not far from the well-known Salomon and Fiji Islands, is a lesser known island group uh, with the name of Vanuatu. And well, I'm saying less, lesser known, but in anthropologist circles, it's very well known because it's what, where one of the most famous examples of a cargo cult took place. Now, cargo cults are practices that have appeared in traditional tribal societies after meeting with more technologically advanced cultures. And the most famous examples date from World War II, when allied forces, mainly the Americans, used those islands as tactical locations. Why? Because they were close to Japan. And so those islanders saw airplanes land with lots of good stuff, the cargo, which they could often profit from. Things that fell from planes, things that were on purpose left by soldiers for the, the natives. And those islanders, they wanted the same thing to keep happening, even after the war ended and the soldiers left. So they started imitating the actions that they believed caused the cargo to appear. They built landing strips. They built airplanes made of wood. They made satellite dishes in wood, wooden headphones, antennas. And then they kept waiting for the airplanes to land with more and more cargo, which they never did. So these people are building, copying things, following these prescribed formulas without understanding the true nature of how it's supposed to work. It's a clear example of form over function. And in 1974, Richard Feynman, the famous scientist, he saw this happening in his field of science. He called it out as cargo cult science. But this focus on form over function can happen everywhere. And today it is happening in our field of UX and design. So I've shared this concept of cargo cults because it's exactly the type of problem that results from these repeatable prescribed formulas. Things become templatized and people start following the steps, adhering to the process more than achieving a result. And it's gone out of hands. We've seen it happening to design thinking to the point of it becoming a literal joke. And design sprint is nothing more than a fast food weaponized version of design thinking. In design sprints, it is even worse. Everything is prescribed to the letter. And the moment you start giving a step-by-step -step plan, 
people start checking the boxes. And design sprints, they really do prescribe. Even the lunch breaks are planned. And very quickly, almost automatically, the focus starts shifting from results to the process. Just do what the template says. Just call it between the lines. Just keep performing the steps. Whatever your project or challenge, you always have to use the same methods in the prescribed order for the prescribed time. Now, I oppose this because matching the client's challenges with a specific cure, it's what makes us professionals. We, can, we, we couldn't outsource this reflection to a book that claims that as long as you follow the steps, everyone can do it. And this, this aspect of everyone can do it brings me to the next issue, where if everyone becomes a designer, it's, it, it seems to sound nice at first, but it just leads to design by committee. There is this movement of UX evangelization to get more people to understand and use UX, to get a seat at the table, to get the company to become more UX mature. It's a good goal. However, one of the techniques they employ is UX democratization, where everyone can be a designer. And democratization sounds like a good thing because it's got the word democracy in it. But in reality, it very quickly becomes well designed by committee, where everybody can directly voice their opinions to influence UX activities and UX designs. In design sprints, all major and minor design decisions are made by the entire group. And people start thinking anybody can do UX because they did it in a workshop. And I couldn't phrase this any better than these people. So especially Debbie Levitt, she has been a driving force to point out the detrimental effects of these type of activities. We thought that if we gave up our power, made everything into a workshop and democratized our job, people would start caring about design or respect us. However, any authority we had over the product, the system that we were designing is gone because other people we teach them that basically they can do our job. Just do a crazy eight and everybody can sketch. Let the decider decide on the best design. And the problem here is we can't have both. You cannot go around evangelizing that UX is special and important and difficult. And it's supposed to be done by experts like you. And at the same time, get everybody in a room to hold workshops where anybody can do UX, where we can guess at crazy, guess at crazy eights and, and guess at journey maps and then give the product manager the final vote. This is not the way forward. Now, when I make this point, a, a counterpoint I often receive is that, well, I understand it, but in a design sprint, what's really good about it is it helps us to really kick off the project. Uh, I don't agree because it's especially at those kickoffs at the beginning that you're setting examples, you're setting precedents. So look, if the first thing you're teaching your client or your stakeholders is the fact that the first thing a UX person does is guess at solutions, and we cannot even come up with our solutions. We have to have everyone involved. We do not need insights into users. Research is actually super optional, and everyone can design interfaces and interactions. It's simple and it's really quick, with the emphasis on quick. That's not the way forward. And, and the fact that it needs to be quick is something, well, that's actually the third big problem I have with this. It's this emphasis on speed instead of quality. It's getting out of hand. Like it used to be five days, but then that was too long. Then it became the four day sprint, the sprint 2.0, then the three day sprint, then the three hour sprint, the weekend sprint. Like I thought we took our job because we want to do good things for people. Do we hate our users so much that we cannot stand seeing them for more than one day at, at most? And even that is too much. Like, I'm sorry to break it to you, but the great discoveries of our world were not made in one week sprints. Speed is not smart if you're moving in the wrong direction. Design sprint proponents in the book, they claim it's for really big novel problems. What sense does it make that the bigger the problem is, the less time we devote to it, the less research we do? How much corners are we okay cutting? All for the sake of cramming it all in one week or in three days or in one weekend. And the main way the design sprint crams it all in one week besides, of course, asking everyone to do nothing else for five days, is by prescribing everything up front. UX by template, repeatable, just follow the formula. So instead of getting this, you're actually getting this. Design sprints are design fast food, and that shouldn't be all you eat. So I promised you I was going to end on a positive note, and I will keep that promise. What now? Well, there are some things the design sprint got right. They didn't invent it, but I will give them a bit of credit. The first thing is dedicated time to really focus 
on a subject, on a topic, instead of being spread across eight different projects or teams. Focus is good. Not having to context switch constantly, it's good. Um, secondly, cross-functional collaboration. Co-curation is good. Working with your colleagues, fantastic. Workshops are really good if you do them well. Um, this is much better to work together than just to throw a briefing over the wall and hope that it lands. And finally, minimal time between the first time you start sketching or designing and the time you start testing it. I agree. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be time before starting to sketch to understand the problem at hand. We shouldn't be in the business of throwing shit at walls and hoping that it sticks. But I do agree that as soon as you start designing, the first usability test shouldn't be too far off. Now, to summarize, these are the things where I feel we should absolutely part ways away from the design sprint. There is the research. User research puts the user in user experience. There is no way around that. Good upfront research to understand the problem is essential, and it needs to be followed up by good usability testing to see, is it a usable product? What are the usability problems? We shouldn't use design sprints as a catch-all formula. We should be better at workshops, focus on the problems to solve and the outcomes to achieve. It's our job to have the company make better UX decisions. We don't do that by having other people make the UX decisions because the book told us to do so. And stop doing crazy aids with non-designers. Accountants don't ask us to do accounting. Marketing doesn't ask us to make a marketing campaign. We, we, should, we need our colleagues for their input, yeah, but not to do our job. It's, it's inefficient and to be honest, it's ridiculous. And finally, it should be okay for UXers to be specialists, just like architects and data analysts and developers and engineers and doctors. It's okay to be good at your job in a way that other people aren't good at that same job. And facilitation can be a part of your job as a designer. And in fact, it's a very smart future-proof skill to have, but it should enable user-centered design. It shouldn't replace it. We are not a show. We are not an arts and crafts project. We are professionals. We have skills in user research, information architecture, interaction, interface design. You, you have those skills, skills that other people lack. Use those skills to make good stuff that works for the people who need it, improve their lives, and achieve business results as a consequence of that. This is the way forward. Um, that was my talk, um, but I don't want to end before thanking these people, uh, without their inspiration and, and the content that they make, I couldn't have made this talk uh, the way that it ended up. Thank you very much, and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Wow, Glenn. I think the consensus from the audience is that there were a lot of truth bombs dropped, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people understand now why they don't have eight minute abs either. Um, so <laughs> uh, outstanding, very well researched. Thank you so much. Um, you're getting lots of claps and applause. Um, no, but seriously, um, I think you touched on some really, some really amazing points in that, in that talk. And I'm really happy that, um, you know, you didn't hold back. <laughs> um, I think that all of us can kind of see ourselves uh, tagged in this photo and we don't like it. Um, props to the memes. Uh, and it's important as designers to always be critical of our processes. Um, you know, the, the, the trend or the fad or the thing that we think is going to work amazing, uh, you know, last year is not necessarily uh, going to be the, the silver bullet. And so we should constantly be um, questioning and criticizing the, the tactics that we use. So um, really, really appreciate a very, very honest um, review, analysis, and breakdown of, of everything that's wrong, and a few things that, it, that design sprints um, get right. Um, I have to say there wasn't a lot of questions, and, and we're just about at time right now, but I, I do think that uh, there's going to be some good discussion in the Q&A, because I think that you um, hit a lot of nerves. I think that you um, uh, put out some very provocative thoughts uh, that are well appreciated by this audience. Um, and um, yeah, thanks so much. And I, I guess I will throw out one one quick question because I, I think that right now 
Um, you're right. It uh, it is used by a lot of designers or agencies uh, or even um, you know internal uh, 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 companies, you know client side companies, uh, to use a design sprint to kind of just like kick things off and get people engaged and if nothing else, kind of like get stakeholders on board and make people feel like they're part of the process. Um, I don't know. Like, do you do you have any suggestions for how to kind of keep that feeling going, but but also kind of maintain the the I don't know the uh, the purity of the process, or if, if for lack of a better term, um, like like uh, what, what what do you see as kind of the replacement um, to a well, design? Sprint? That's an excellent question. Um, so I think there are some ingredients of the design sprint we can keep on using. Um, I, I've pointed out which ones we shouldn't. The, what I would do um, to kick things off with a client. It's it's quite typical. It's a workshop where I want to understand their needs. I tend to see mm -hmm. them as users as well. So mm -hmm. basically, this this comes down to uh, it's something that exists. I think officially it's called impact mapping. It's where we try to figure out what is the business direction, what's the strategy you are aiming for, mm -hmm. and so we we steer away from deliverables and features and solutions. Mm -hmm. And also, we realize that we don't yet understand the user needs. We don't talk about that today. Today, in that workshop, we're talking about what are your business needs? Where do you yeah. want to go? And then mm -hmm. we start considering, OK, which types of people, which types of potential customers or existing customers, whose behavior needs to be changed in a good way to change their lives, but also to get you towards more business results? Mm -hmm. And then, so what we're doing there is we start defining user groups, basically audience, um, target audiences. Mm -hmm. And then we start realizing that, well, to get them, their behavior to change, we need to know what's not going well today. Because as you know, habits are difficult to change. So we need to understand their workflows, what's working well and what's not working well. And that leads us to the, the very logical and unavoidable conclusion that this requires research. But by Targeting, targeting it from this angle, you frame the research as something that is business-wise, financially essential to reach their goals. And the success of actually being able to do research tends to become a bit higher because you frame it in their needs. We shouldn't be dogmatic. I, I won't go there and tell, you, should, you need to do research because the ISO norm of UX says so. I try to frame it in why they really need research if they want to be successful the next year. Yeah. 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 I think it also just comes down to, you know, who gives the best input for which pieces of the, of the puzzle, which pieces of the architecture or the solution, you know, clients can talk about vision and, you know, business goals um, and, and, and they can be aware of the process or participate in the process. But ultimately at the end of the day, you know, clients shouldn't be, solutioning themselves or at least you know solely by themselves um I, you know um yeah we, we need to value the contributions from from the different disciplines um as they're as they're needed and appropriate so yeah. no lots of really thought-provoking uh things i i think i'm, I'm definitely gonna watch your talk again on youtube after we post it again um there's yeah. so many great nuggets in there so thank you very much uh for joining us tonight um, it was a pleasure to have you on stage again. And um, like I said earlier, we're going to open up a session for Glenn. So if you want to talk about this topic further, uh, he'll be there uh, to do that. And I'm also going to join the uh, the networking. If you're interested in winning a ticket to the Design X or sorry, the Web Expo uh, events, you uh, uh, need to be the third networking person that I connect with. Um, uh, so I will see you over there. And uh, without further ado, I wish you a good evening. Um, just really quickly, our next event, uh, obviously, is next month on the last Tuesday. That is September 28th. Um, it's hosted by Can Design in Antwerp um, near um, Harmony Park. Um, if all goes well, that could be uh, uh, an in-person event. It would be lovely to see all of your faces in the flesh again. So um, we'll keep you posted, like I said, on Slack and also on Meetup. Uh, so keep an eye out for um, upcoming events um, IRL and uh, maybe we'll see each other soon. Uh, yes, have a good evening and I will see you um, on the other side. Take care, good night.